Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> yourself, man. The second Senate impeachment trial of Donald Trump begins tomorrow. It's almost unthinkable they'll move to convict him. It would take the vote of 17 Republicans to do so. But don't fall into the trap of thinking it's therefore an empty exercise. Democrats believe they had no choice, that he willfully incited violent insurrection to defy the democratic result of the election, and that failure to bring the trial is tantamount to condoning the behaviour. Trump's legal team believe it's brazen political persecution and that you can't impeach a former president. But over the course of the next few days, maybe weeks, we'll be watching for something more subtle than voting numbers. We'll see how powerful the grip Donald Trump still has over the Republican Party and whether senators believe their voters still want to see him in charge. This will be a moment for Democrats to realise what kind of an opposition party they face and for Republicans to decide what kind of a party they want to be. In a moment, we'll look at new footage of what happened that day of violence on the Capitol. But we start with David Grossman in Washington. We've got some sense, David, of the form that the impeachment trial will take. Just walk us through it. Yes, in the last hour, Emily, congressional leaders Chuck Schumer for the Democrats and Senator Mitch McConnell for the Republicans came to an agreement of the bare bones of the format that this trial will take. They're going to kick off with constitutional arguments tomorrow to decide that very central question. Can a former president of the United States stand trial for impeachment uh, charges in the Senate? The Republicans, or at least the president's legal team, say it's ridiculous. He's already left office. You can't throw him out a second time. The Democrats say there's something more significant at, at stake there. That is preventing him, setting down a marker and also preventing him from standing for office again. After that, there's going to be 16 hours of legal arguments of each side. If uh, the Democrats decide they can maybe push for witnesses to be called. That would then require a straight up and down vote. They would have to get 51 senators to get witnesses. And then there's going to be a break for the Jewish Sabbath. One of the president's legal team wishes to observe that particular day. And then they're going to resume for questions and deliberations on Sunday. It looks very clear that this is a very much an expedited uh, schedule. This is going to be more like days than weeks, at least perhaps only one week. And we've been given a little taste of the kind of arguments each side will be using. What are you hearing? Well, it's clear that the Democrats intend to put on a pretty impressive show of audio-visual um, snippets of, uh, of video and news reports of the day and the days leading up to it. They say that the president used the word fight 16 times in that speech that he gave outside the White House on the morning of the 6th of January before the insurrection and the riot at the Capitol. Now, Trump's team say that it's become very clear that the assault was planned long before that morning, so therefore his words can't be seen as the incitement to the events that we saw unfold in the building and the buildings around me uh, on that day in January. But in any case, they say he has a First Amendment right to free speech. He's allowed to say what he wants. And the test of, the, of, in, uh, of incitement is actually quite tough in the American legal system. Interesting. David, thanks very much indeed. Well, as you heard David uh, explaining there, the Democrats have let it be known they'll be bringing previously unseen footage from January the 6th into the impeachment trial. They want Senate Republicans to see the consequences of what they say are Donald Trump's repeated attempts over two months or more to repeal the result. Well, tonight we bring you a forensic examination of the events of that day, revealing the extent of planning and coordination amongst the Capitol insurgents. Gabriel Gatehouse is here. Just talk us through what you found, Gabe. I mean, Emily, one of the fascinating things about January the 6th is uh, that so many of the people who stormed the Capitol that day filmed themselves doing it and then uploaded that evidence to social media. Now, it may be, and this may be relevant in the impeachment trial, that they did that because they thought the president had basically given them permission to do this. But then when the FBI starts arresting people, a lot of that footage disappears. Parler gets taken down. So what we've done is we've spent several weeks um, working with a open source investigative journalist based in the US, Emmanuel uh, Saliba. And we've been trawling through the internet archives. We've been unearthing some of that deleted footage and um, going back over some of the pictures that are still out there. We've put it all together with some of the footage that Newsnight filmed on the night and together with some really excellent forensic work done by the likes of the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, we've got a picture that emerges of really 
two very different types of insurrectionists. Here's our report, and I should warn you that it does contain some pretty strong language. It's just before noon. Thousands of Trump supporters have gathered on the ellipse opposite the White House. Many have been waiting here for hours. At the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue, in the Capitol, members of Congress are preparing to certify the results of the election that will make Joe Biden America's 46th president. The crowd at the ellipse is a mix of people, men and women, young and old. Some display what appear to be militia symbols. These are from a group called the Oath Keepers. We'll see them again later. But mostly, they're sporting the apparel familiar from so many rallies. MAGA hats and Trump flags. They're here because they've been fed a lie. This is a fraud on the American public. We've never lost an election. This was a massive fraud, probably the most fraudulent election that anyone's ever seen. In a few minutes, Donald Trump will make a speech that will, in the words of the impeachment filing, aim them like a loaded cannon down Pennsylvania Avenue. Just before the president comes out to speak, his son, Don Jr., records this video backstage. I can't believe the size of the crowds that I'm seeing out there. But not everybody is waiting for Donald Trump to appear. If you're not a proud boy, please stay out of our ranks. These are the Proud Boys, another right-wing militia, seen a little earlier that morning. Out of your boy! Donald Trump will not appear for another hour or so, but they're already heading towards the Capitol. This footage was shot by Newsnight's David Grossman. Some of it is broadcast here for the first time. What's the plan tonight? We're taking our fucking country back. It was clear they were pretty well organized. There was a guy at the front with a loud hailer and another guy in a sort of gray check jacket. Now he had a radio and every now and again he would sort of stop and talk into the radio. It's clear he was communicating, getting messages, sending messages to somebody. Now I knew they were the Proud Boys because well they told me that, but what I hadn't appreciated was just how senior those guys at the front were. The man in the checked shirt is Joe Biggs, a Proud Boy leader from Florida. Slow it down on the left. His friend with the loud hailer is Ethan Nordeen, another member of the group. So representing the spirit of 1776, if you haven't noticed, real men are here. We know what the oath is, support, support defend the Constitution of the United States against foreign enemies and domestic. Let us remind those who have forgotten what that means. Both men would be at the forefront of the assault on the Capitol. Even before the election, Donald Trump had given the Proud Boys a not so tacit nod of approval during one of the debates. Proud so Boys, Ooh, and right the Proud militia. Boys, stand back and stand by. Now it seems they believe their time has come. In front of our cameras, they're not forthcoming about their plans. But in other footage, there is a suggestion of what lies ahead. As a member of the group, apparently nicknamed Milkshake, shouts, there anyway, Take the fucking capital. <laughs> It's not clear whether this is one man's bravado or evidence of a plan. Let's not fucking yell that, all right? Just milkshake, you know. <laughs> Again, we see Biggs and Nordine. Idiot. Donald Trump has not yet started speaking. He appears on stage at noon and about 15 minutes into his speech, starts urging his supporters to converge on the Capitol. I know that everyone here will soon be marching over to the Capitol building to peacefully and patriotically make your voices heard. USA! USA! While the president is still speaking, outside the Capitol, the crowd is swelling. A Trump supporter by the name of Chris was live streaming the event and he agreed to speak to us. I was looking back towards the crowd at that moment in the video um, somebody was talking on a bullhorn in front of me. Nordine and Biggs are visible in the crowd. Then a man in a blue denim jacket appears. His flag obscures Biggs, but it looks like there's an exchange between them. 
There was nothing that appeared to be organized going on other than everybody was just standing there. But less than two minutes later, the man in the denim jacket spearheads a march towards the police barrier. <laughs> I was caught by surprise, and I whip the camera around towards the Capitol, and I see the gate go over, and everybody starts pushing towards the Capitol. This is a key moment. It's the first time the crowd breaks through the police lines onto the Capitol grounds. Trump is still speaking. The time is 12.53. The police, outnumbered, try to contain them. Again, we see familiar faces in the melee. Hey. Later, another Proud Boy member is seen breaking into the Capitol building itself. Dominic Pezzola is a former Marine from New York State. When Joe Biggs makes his way inside, he's elated. Fuck you! Biggs, what you gotta say? He fools you! Nordine, Biggs and Pezzola have been charged. They're among at least a dozen members of the Proud Boys to have been arrested in connection with the assault on the Capitol. According to an FBI affidavit, the man in the denim jacket is Ryan Samson. He's not known to have any affiliation with the Proud Boys. Donald Trump ended his speech with perhaps his most incendiary comments of the day. And we fight. We fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. So let's walk down Pennsylvania Avenue. Unlike the Proud Boys we've been tracking, members of another militia did stay for the speech. At least most of it. These were the Oath Keepers. We saw them with their black hoodies with yellow lettering at the beginning of the film. The New York Times has tracked their movements that afternoon. Shortly before one, at almost the exact time that the first barrier is breached on the west side of the Capitol, they're seen filing out of the ellipse. Among them was Jessica Watkins, a 38-year-old army veteran from Ohio. After the speech, she and a number of others get changed into full battle dress and head over to the east side of the capital. At just after half past two, a group of them are seen filing up the steps in military formation. Another camera captures them as they reach the doors, Jessica Watkins among them. Ten minutes later, she and a colleague, Donovan Crowell, are inside recording selfies on his phone. Took over the Capitol, overran the Capitol. We're in the fucking Capitol, bro. Watkins and Crowell have been charged with conspiracy, along with a third member of the group. According to an FBI affidavit, Watkins and other Oath Keepers communicated by walkie-talkie during the incursion. In one recording, captured by a reporter for New York Public Radio, a voice believed to be Watkins says, We have a good group. We got about 30, 40 of us. We're sticking together and sticking to the plan. We'll see you soon, Jess. Airborne. Do that, brother. Godspeed and fair winds to us. Amen, sister. Stay safe. The actions of groups like the Oath Keepers, the Proud Boys and others suggest a level of planning and organization that preceded Trump's speech on the day. But that's not the full story. A lot of the footage that day suggests a disparate and disorganized group of people united only by a perceived grievance. Us American people deserve the fucking truth. They were responding to calls from President Donald Trump to come to Washington to stop the constitutional process of the Congress certifying the election for President Biden. So this is clearly a case of political violence. Some of these people look like they just went with the flow. Don't break stuff. You don't want to be liable. And when they found themselves inside the citadel of political power, had no idea what to do. 89% of the Capitol Hill insurrectionists have no connection to a militant organization like the Proud Boys or the Oath Keepers. 
A team of researchers at the University of Chicago has analyzed the profiles of nearly 200 people who've been arrested for their part in the assault on the Capitol. And they're perhaps not the kind of people you might expect. The norm with political violence is to see people in their late 20s, maybe early 30s. Here, the average age is 40. Point number two is how few are unemployed. 40% of the Capitol Hill insurrectionists are business owners, CEOs, and white collar occupations. They're doctors, uh, they're lawyers, uh, they're accountants, they're IT specialists. Um, this is uh, extremely extraordinary. Chris, the live stream, says he did not go inside the Capitol building itself. He has mixed feelings about what happened that day. I've actually had a hard time watching my video. Really? Yeah. It, it, it brings back it. a lot of emotion because it was such an emotional moment that happened. Um, so, yeah, I, I, strangely, I have. It, it's, it's sort of, it still very much bothers me. It, it it clearly felt wrong what was happening because you could see signs that said, you know, off limits, no, you know, stay off property, uh, keep out signs. I definitely felt a sort of patriotism. I knew what in their hearts they were fighting for because those are the stories that we had heard. That's the injustice, we'll call it, that they were that they were out there for. And, and that's the emotion and the energy that I was feeling in that crowd and still to this day do. The assault on the Capitol shook America to its foundations. A second impeachment is an ignominious and unprecedented end to a presidency. But impeachment is a political process. Donald Trump will almost certainly be acquitted again. And the history books will likely record the events of the 6th of January not as the culmination of four turbulent years, but as the start of a still more unpredictable era. I think it's best to see this as the beginning of um, the emergence of a new movement with violence at its core. What we have are the key ingredients for that movement to accelerate its growth going forward. First, there's now a leader with demonstrated support for extra-legal activity. Second, there are masses of people who believe in grievances this uh, stolen election. And third, January 6th was a focal point event. This is an event that brought together many disparate parts of these uh, individuals and is helping to congeal them into an actual movement. That report was by Gabriel Gatehouse. And joining us now, Gabriel Sterling, the Chief Operating Officer for Georgia's Republican Secretary of State, whose comments you might remember denouncing the peddling of misinformation over the election results saw him briefly become world famous as a Republican voting Trump voting voice who had not been afraid to speak out. Here's a short reminder of what he said last December. Mr. President, it looks like you likely lost the state of Georgia. We're investigating. There's always a possibility. I get it. You have the rights to go through the courts. What you don't have the ability to do, and you need to step up and say this, is stop inspiring people to commit potential acts of violence. Someone's going to get hurt. Someone's going to get shot. Someone's going to get killed. We also have Steve Bolton. He's the GOP chair in Chicago who believes the Democrats have got carried away on political theatre. And I'm going to start, if I can, with you, Gabriel Sterling. Um, hearing those words again, someone's going to get hurt, someone's going to get shot, someone's going to get killed. I know you didn't want to be right about this in December, but as it turns out, you were. Your, your thoughts on that? Disappointing is not the right word. Horrified is a better way to, to put it, because... You could see what the potentials were, and yet the president persisted. And the outcomes we saw is, is unless we right the ship of state and allow for people on the left and the right who feel voiceless to get their grievances done, 
in a way that doesn't involve violence, I, I'm worried it could be a prelude to a continuing deterioration over time. That clip went viral last December, mainly because you seemed to be uh, a sole voice at the time. You were right in the middle of uh, the Georgia election, obviously, that had been contested by the president. But were you surprised more in your party weren't calling out the potential for violence at the time? Why weren't they? Well, in some ways, it's hard to see because, I mean, People in the party who have a voice are generally elected officials, and elected officials like to be liked by their base of supporters. I tend to be a Burkean about this, and Edmund Burke said at the time, you owe your constituency your judgment and your moral clarity. As we, you shouldn't just be a weather vane. And it's difficult sometimes. And the president puts people in these boxes. He did it to the two senators, or now the two former senators in my state, and basically put them in, a, in an untenable position of saying, support these voter fraud claims or I'm going to torpedo your campaigns. And as it ends up supporting those voter claims, torpedo their campaigns anyway. So they got the worst of all worlds. Steve Bolton, can I bring you in on that question? Because it's so interesting about um, Burke's notion of representative democracy. Do you believe that senators uh, that are voting in, in the weeks ahead have to follow their conscience or just do what their voters at home tell them? Well, that's one of the great questions of representative democracy, Burke versus the persons who will say that, no, you have to go back and find out what your constituents say and represent them. We have that problem here in Illinois because one of our representatives, Adam Kinzinger, voted to impeach President Trump, yet the base of his Republican support in his congressional district has already censured him for that vote. So there's a strong dichotomy already. I tend to uh, go more with the Burke aspect. I think that censuring uh, Mr. Kinzinger is wrong. I don't believe in that. I believe in free speech. However, there's no doubt that the emotion about this is still strong. But when you say the emotion is still strong, I mean, that massively underplays what's happening because the Democrats believe that it was willful incitement to violence, not just not with one speech on the day, but with everything that came before in Donald Trump's language. You could even say preceding the election itself. And your party has to decide fundamentally whether it's going to go along with those kind of lies. No, see, there's a false premise there. You're starting with it's a lie and therefore we have to act. My point is we're going to have a trial in the United States Senate. That's fine. Bring on the trial. Let's see what the evidence truly shows and whether they're truly convinced. Because my point is that this is a nation of laws and not of men. And so President Trump is entitled to his action under law and not of men. And I note that in your own piece here today, you left out the fact that in his speech, President Trump called for peaceful demonstrations at the Capitol. Your quote of him cut out right before he said those words. You know, uh, as well as I do, better than I do, this is not a criminal court. This is a, a, a political staged event. And that actually the senators will find according to what they feel their party wants them to say. You're not going to get 17 Republicans, I, I presume you think, even if they had all the evidence in the world, because it's about the politics, isn't it? Well, that's your somewhat jaded viewpoint of it. My point about it is, is that many of the Republicans don't even think that this is a constitutional process at all because he's left office. And this is, no, this is nothing more than a political show trial put on by Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi in order to keep hysteria in Washington and across the country alive and well. Uh, I find that the Republican base actually is very strongly behind President Trump. And if anything, Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer are making him stronger by turning him into a martyr. I, I wonder, Gabriel, uh, starting whether you heard the end of, of our reporter's piece. Uh, it was Rob Page from the uh, Chicago Project who said, we are beginning to see the emergence of a new movement with violence at its core. This is um, the direction of the party now. It, is that going too far, or do you recognize that the people who came to protest that day were not just a few extremists, they were, they were people who had been turned by the words that the president had said? I do think that's probably going too far, and I agree with my colleague that this is a Democrat show trial. They are trying to, they, they, they have rushed this process. They are doing things that are actually making Trump and his claims stronger. And using this kind of divisive politics by the left and the right is creating long-term issues in this country. And by making more of a martyr of it and rushing the process and then, you know, 
they wrote the impeachment articles in such a way as that there was no way any most Republicans were able to vote that way. And I don't think it's the, the emergence of a basis of a new party or a new thing with violence at its core. And let's look at the one other thing that's happening here is Trump is a cult of personality to a degree right now. But if you look at what happened with Liz Cheney, was basically they said a whole group of the, I want to call it Trumpian wing, I don't want to characterize it too much that way. She said, fine, give me a vote of confidence. And she won that vote 100, 145 to 61 with one random present for some reason. So it shows a lot of these representatives and senators know what to do, but they're trying to handle the fine line of dealing with a base that Trump has a very strong emotional hold on and the actions the Democrats are taking serve them politically, but yeah. doesn't serve the nation. They know what to do when the vote is secret. We all know that the, the Liz Cheney ballot was secret. Um, mm -hmm. Let me put that one to you, Steve Bolton, because at the moment, Liz Cheney, who spoke up uh, against the behaviour of her party's president and, and voted for impeachment, her career was threatened more for rejecting dangerous conspiracies than Marjorie Taylor Greene, was for believing them. Is that the direction that you are happy to see the Republican Party go in? No, but I think that the allegation that there's some new violent movement that is some sort of a subset of the Republican Party is absolutely one of the most irresponsible things I've seen in media in recent weeks, anyway. Um, it's just not true. This is just hysteria that's being rip, okay. ripped up in the media. So there's no hysteria at all. It came from a report which is backed up from a study of the people in those crowds. And what they found was, I think it was the figure was 89%. We're not part of an extremist wing. It's quite the opposite. It's not that they I were agree. part of the Proud Boys. I fully it's, agree with that. Right. It's not that they were part of the Oath Keepers. It's not that they were uh, aligned to a certain extremist wing. It's that these were the people who moved to try and overturn a democratic result at the behest of their president. That's the question you're having to be faced with now as a, as a party, because these people have grievances from what they've just been told. Well, you know, ma'am, I would say that the same thing I said to President Trump about his allegations of election fraud. I said, prove them in court, and he hasn't. And I actually, in my party, refused to even advertise the demonstrations on the 6th because I said the man has not proved his case in court. So I would put it back to you, and why do we see what they can actually prove in court as opposed to in the news media? So when you say in court, you mean in, in a in front Senate of the, the Senate trial. in a court of appearance. Let's see what kind of evidence they come to, and also the American people will make their own judgment. But to start out with premises, as is going on here, I think is just wrong. The same way I said to President Trump, if you can prove your case, prove it. I say to the Democratic senators, if you can prove and the House managers, if you can prove your case, prove it. What happens over the next few weeks will define your party's political fortunes, presumably for the coming years. You'll, you'll recognize I don't, I don't that. Agree, I, don't agree, I don't agree with that at all. I, I actually think I, I yeah, don't let agree me bring with that to, let, let me bring in Gabriel Sterling. Uh, go on. You, you don't think anything that matters over the coming weeks will define the direction of the Republican Party. Is that what you're saying? You know, they define the direction of the Republican Party's primaries. And, you know, some of the actions are going to happen here. With this media environment we have today, this is going to be ancient history by the time anybody goes back to the ballot box again. And there will be a fight internally for the Republican, the Republican Party as to what kind of party we want to be. So let and me, just, let me focused... ask you on that, on that question. Do you think that the grip that Donald Trump has currently over the Republican Party will last? I don't think so. I'm, I'm, we have, we've had cults of personalities before. We've seen it in the past. When political fortunes change on a dime, even in the near-term history, Watergate happened and we got smashed in 74. But by 1980, Ronald Reagan went on to win a landslide and get reelected in the 49 states. I mean, American democracy is very resilient. It doesn't buy into personality politics the way it has in the past. But there are going to have to be some things that are done by Republicans and Democrats alike to listen to the people who feel voiceless. And that's what really feeds this populist movement. And then what happened on the 6th was you have a, a few hundred people who got whipped into a frenzy and got caught up in a, in a mob situation that nobody, like one of the gentlemen who was interviewed, he looked back and said, I don't know why I did that. It didn't make any sense. And and. That is not the direction of political party. That is one particular thing that, yes, I think the president does have culpability for with all of his statements, going back to the time I said it in December. But I don't think, by Democrats making more of a martyr him, they're strengthening his hand. The thing is, that's sort of what they want to do. They want to make Donald Trump and Marjorie Taylor Greene the face of our party, not yes. Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger. It's really interesting to hear from both of you. Gabriel Sterling and Steve Bolton, thanks very much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Emily.